Hello everybody, I am Alexander Williamson, the creator of The Secret History, Living in Your Aquariums. Welcome, and today we're going to be talking about the role humans played in domesticating Beta Splendens. Now, for the lack of uh, a better term, I'm going to be calling domesticated Bettas, Bettas, and not Beta Splendens. There is a wild fish known as the Beta Splendens, and there are the fish that we keep, which usually are identified as Beta Splendens. However, due to breaking news in the research world, we now understand that Bettas are actually a conglomeration of six different species, not all in one fish necessarily, but depending on where you find them around the world, they can be any number of a combination of six species all the way down to just one that have been domesticated specifically. And we're going to talk about what true domestication means on an anatomical and genetic level in this video. And we're going to talk about all the incredible new findings that have just come out that fill in our written history. And for me as an anthropologist and historian, you know, I like to go off the facts of the material that we find on the scene that we can date with other things and tell you, yes, this happened at this time. But unfortunately, we just don't have that with the first beta being kept as a pet or the first beta being kept for any reason. And now, thanks to massive improvements in genetic testing and research, we've been able to fill in a lot of those blanks. And finally, we can come up with a comprehensive history that's a whole lot better than the one you'll find online. If you go to any site, even that's very specialized in bettas, you'll see the same story of the history of bettas. And it's a few paragraphs that mentions being kept for over 150 years, whatever that means, and that there was a king in Siam that gave them to a Danish doctor that gave them to a French guy that then also they came to America, Russia, and the UK. And that was all around 1900, and then after that they bred a bunch of different tails on them and uh, fins on them. And that's kind of the end of the details. Well, I have been researching this video for over two years now, and I'm really excited to bring you guys along for the ride and tell you the incredible story of the domestication of the betta. So, hello and welcome. This is going to be a very deep dive on bettas. I'm confident in saying uh, this is probably more researched and more comprehensive than anything I've found available in any letter literature or single body of writing or research up to this day on the internet or elsewhere. Now, I must also let you know that this is going to be a deep dive video that takes some time and we need to explain a few things out of chronological order if we want to reconstruct an accurate timeline of how this fish went from a somewhat grumpy rice patty invader to a valuable and much beloved pet. I also want to mention that history is subject to alterations and amendments. As new evidence and artifacts are discovered, uh, history is rewritten. For this video and research project, I have used nearly all my skills as a historian, an anthropologist, and an archaeologist to try and recreate this amazing story uh, from all the little pieces of all those puzzles and tell you the origins of the beta. Now this takes an immense amount of time and I'm only going to mention it this once, but I really do greatly appreciate it if you guys want to hit that thumbs up button, uh, comment, subscribe, or share any of this content. If the video has earned it, I would be extremely grateful. Uh, for viewers who watch this channel regularly, thank you so much, and for those of you members who have allowed me to create this video over the last two years, thank you so much. Being a member is only $1.99, and you get a bunch of behind-the-scenes access, including when I talk about all the different bits of evidence we're going to talk about in this video. A lot of those were standalone stories when that work was published a year ago, a year and a half ago, and people in my uh, channel community may already have heard some of these pieces. However, not all together, and there's a lot of new 
uh, info with it. But I just wanted to say thank you all, and here comes uh, one of those uh, caveats I also need to give before the video starts, which is I must warn that seeing as this is a history partly about the humanity uh, of humans and fish, uh, it will cover quite a bit of cruelty. Uh, first, I want to warn those whom rather not watch the true details of how this fish came to be, that throughout the story we are going to talk about humans subjecting animals to uh, violence, for lack of a better word, and behaviors that seem somewhat repulsive by today's world standards. However, I can try and tell you guys that this is something that happened in the context of history. Life was really hard. War, famine, plagues, drought, and living to a much younger age due to things like a toothache causing you to pass away were just common everyday realities. And so I just want folks to remember that there's a certain context to which these actions happen, and there's also a certain culture in which these things occurred, and it does, shouldn't reflect on the people of the regions or the people involved today. So next, I also want to mention many sources are being quoted around the internet and in quality books even, and they're out of date and ridiculously vague. So in the coverage of the domestication of Beta, uh, this is the first episode of that complete comprehensive history. And we will, be, we will be discussing a very specific timeline in this video first. And it is the timeline that doesn't get discussed in those sources. It's always overlooked. And that is from the time when humans first encountered wild betta species in their agricultural and aquacultural based daily lives of, of rice farming up to when they began to selectively breed hybridized species and keep them as pets and as a pastime. We will end this chapter uh, of today's video just prior to the modern establishment of the international pet trade and just as bettas are being successfully brought back to Europe and the Americas. Uh, but before we jump into the human influence story, uh, we need to go over the natural history and evolution of this fish to have a firm background on the reasons why and where and when bettas became domesticated. Bettas are a member of the labyrinth fish group. Labyrinth fishes are a group formed over 60 million years ago, and they live in hypoxic environments. Uh, that appears to be the driving force behind their diversification evolutionarily. Labyrinth fishes, including the genus of betta, uh, are a diverse group from the family of Osphoronomidae, and with more than 75 species of what we would call betta. Labyrinth fishes evolved a variety of behavioral and morphological as well as physical traits in response to low oxygen puddles and pools of water where they often lived. They were often also found in very hot and humid conditions. And uh, just a side note, the development of air breathing uh, through the labyrinth organ was because of this. And uh, if you're breeding these fish, it's important to keep the air above them humid and moist or that uh, organ may not actually uh, form correctly and the fish may not be able to breathe air correctly uh, at the top of the tank. Okay, so while living in a hypoxic or low oxygen environment, the labyrinth organ may be one of the most obvious traits, but there are other traits in this evolutionary group of uh, qualities, and that is bubble nest building uh, for reproduction and also mouth brooding. And these different, uh, these different styles of strategies to raise young in low pH, low dissolved oxygen, oxygen, and also a environment that is fairly free of big predatory fish coming to eat them. So the eggs are usually going to be laid by bettas at the surface, uh, and this will increase oxygen for the eggs while the, uh, the eggs are in the bubble nest. And it also prevents the eggs from drying out at the same time because the fish will form a sort of mucus with its own biofilm and saliva, and it will use tannins and other compounds from the environment to kind of uh, secrete this 
uh, sticky situation <laughs> that becomes what we think of as bubble nests that the males typically build. So while spawning, uh, males also tend to be aggressive because they're guarding these nests. And that is especially true when they're spawning, but it's not always true when they are on their own and not spawning. So just wanted to mention that. Whenever they are found, uh, Betta splendens generally inhabit really shallow bodies of water with a lot of vegetation, including marshes, floodplains, and historically rice paddies. Uh, there is a prevalence of rice farming across Southeast Asia, and it provided an ideal habitat for bettas to spread. So it's probably due to humans in the first place that bettas were able to take over a lot of Southeast Asia. We created like the perfect environment for these fish. And uh, it's because of this and the contact of humans having to be very, very involved with rice cultivation. Uh, you have to drain the fields, you have to hand harvest the rice, there's all sorts of things you have to do and uh, take care of, and it's a very narrow window to harvest. And because of this, humans are very, very uh, in tune with the ecosystem and environment of a rice paddy field, more so than maybe like a wheat field or something. So this is where they came into contact with feta and chana or snakehead fish and uh, garamis and carp and all sorts of other eels and things. So the combination of that shallow water and high air temperature causes uh, gases to really evaporate out of water quickly, leading to the depletion of it in the betta's habitat uh, of those rice paddies or of monsoon puddles that are drying out. And that's where they've decided to live, evolutionarily speaking. Uh, so as stated before, this environment likely led to the evolution of that labyrinth organ, which allows Siamese uh, wrestling fish, like all members of the suborder Anabantidae, to breathe directly from the air. And it should also be mentioned uh, that that relative humidity I was talking about should be about 40% to keep that uh, organ forming properly. So these adaptations mean that bettas can live and even thrive in way harsher environments than a lot of other freshwater fish. And in turn, it leaves them fewer natural predators and competitors for their space. In the wild, bettas thrive at a fairly low population density, actually, which is 1.7 individuals per square meter of water. And that's adult bettas, not babies. The babies will grow up oftentimes together really densely in a puddle, wait for the monsoon season, and then they kind of spread out all over the place. But what we're talking about is the adults, when they're adults two years old or so and out on their own, they're not that densely packed. Uh, however, this depends quite a bit on food availability and water levels. But that's for what we think of as the betta splendens. That's the average. So in the tropical climate that bettas live in, uh, it's characterized by extreme fluctuations in water availability, the chemistry of the water, the pH of the water, and it can be anywhere from neutral at 7.0 pH all the way to alkaline at 8.2 pH because uh, of limestone in the region. And it can be all the way down to like four, three or four pH uh, due to the acidity of all the leaves and things that fall in the jungle. Now, they can also be anywhere from 59 or 60 degrees Fahrenheit uh, up, up in some of the higher hills and uh, plateaus of Southeast Asia uh, at night. And then all the way up to over 110 degrees Fahrenheit in the day in the sun. So these fish are very, very flexible in that sense. So consequently, Siamese uh, warrior fish are probably the most adaptable fish that humans were encountering at this time. And that probably accounts for their early pop popularity as pets and for being domesticated and their ability to colonize those bodies of water all over Southeast Asia. So wild bettas prefer to live in bodies of water teeming with aquatic vegetation and surface foliage, floating uh, plants and leaves, water lilies, and they want that for the security from predators uh, up above and also a buffer for the males during the spawning season so they don't uh, get too densely uh, inhabiting one area. 
And also it allows the females to then kind of scout around the region and uh, try out the different males, check out their uh, beautiful colors and see, you know, which one she wants. And even in the wild, there are many types of bettas that do have beautiful colors. Uh, we'll have to definitely, we'll show you guys some, some of the wild bettas and also some of the uh, plainer wild bettas too, because they come in an array of colors from kind of drab when they're not showing off for spawning, all the way up to pretty darn incredible already. They don't need much work. Uh, and a lot of people like to keep species like Mahat, Chiensis, and others uh, as is. So Southeast Asia and Central China are often cited as the first places to domesticate fish for ornamental reasons. New archaeological evidence indicates that Chinese culture uh, in present-day Yunnan province is probably where aquaculture and agriculture fuse together for the first time, and they start experimenting with fish, irrigation, rice domestication, and using carp to eat algae as well as to eat little pests, bugs, mosquitoes, just to make the life of the farmer easier. Now this evidence, archaeologically speaking, goes back over 12,000 years. So let's take a moment to just appreciate how long the Asiatic people have been living side by side with rice patties, soybeans, domesticated dogs, cats, poultry, undulates, that's uh, stuff with uh, cleft hooves, and also, uh, you know, living with these fish and thinking about these fish, having time to observe these fish. Now, it's only thanks to a paper published just at the end of 2022 uh, that excavated several archaeological sites from the years 9,500 years ago to around 8,000 years ago that we know that two carp species in particular are found in China and were being raised for food, fertilizer, and pest control as well as algae control. And the story is far too detailed to go into right now. But we can say that in those research papers, they clearly cover physical evidence to show that there were pens of these fish being kept separate by age and size, then that they were being harvested. And for a certain period of around uh, 9,500 years ago, we see that the, the fish was just uh, put into the same places where all the food scraps and trash were kept. Whereas by 8,000 years ago, we see that the fish actually their spines, their heads, the, the organs that weren't used, especially in carp, like the tougher scales and things, all of that was actually worked into basically a compost that then was used in the rice fields and part of a more elaborate system of crop rotation and fertilization that began to occur. So we can say for sure that they were at least using fish and understanding that fish were part of the ecology of these rice paddies. So needless to say, koi and goldfish are thought to have arisen from similar fields to these where those carp were. And two or 3,000 years ago, uh, Indian technology from the Indian subcontinent as well as uh, agricultural practices of rice production from ancient China uh, had, well, uh, had had plenty of time to reach Thailand. And it's kind of in this period of probably around 2,000 years ago that we first think that these bettas began to be domesticated. This is also, coincidentally, when goldfish and koi had already begun to be uh, domesticated, and we have physical evidence during the Song Dynasty in the form of writing and historical texts, as well as archaeological evidence. And this is where the setting of bettas being uh, turned into pets begins as well. So in modern day uh, Thailand, which was once referred to British Siam uh, by uh, the Brits, of course, uh, this is uh, undoubtedly where stories of those Song Dynasty uh, goldfish and domesticated carp species were spreading. By 1500 years ago, we are 100% sure that around 500 AD or CE, however you'd like to document that time period, uh, these trade networks ran all the way through Thailand, down through Malaysia and the Malaysian Peninsula, all the way into the Indonesian islands, all the way out to Borneo, and we can physically find Chinese goods 
2,000 miles away from uh, China, no problem. And that's 3,200 kilometers, if you're curious, uh, in, in metric. <laughs> but down into the deep tropics, right on the uh, equa equator in the equatorial regions, are where all of today's wild bettas are found. So it's easy to find that evidence in that region uh, that there were Chinese goods uh, making it out there and Asian goods making it back from way out there up back into China. So it's easy to imagine how the gateway to that Southeast Asian world of Vietnam and Thailand probably could have heard about the fish being domesticated in China, if not even maybe seen them or uh, had access to them after it became a little less just uh, the royal family keeping them, because that's how it was at first. Now, the spice trade and the spice islands and things are also found down that way, and it is um, easy to see and imagine how Thai people of the era that that made their living off of being a trade hub for those spices and then also for artisan goods from China making their way out into Southeast Asia, things like uh, ceramics and uh, handcrafted goods, carved jade, things like that, precious minerals and stones, uh, as well as the Thai are known for their rubies and precious stones as well. So we can also find uh, things in China that tell us 100% we can say it came from this mine in Thailand. So we do know that the cultures were intertwined and uh, Thai people of the era could easily have been exchanging stories of that Chinese empire, their technologies, and perhaps their actual husbandry and aquacultural techniques developed for goldfish and koi. We, we're not sure. This is just pure conjecture on our part. But there exists no writings or images from this period of the betta being domesticated that far back, 1,500 years ago. So for many years, people just breezed over around 800 years of history and said, uh, we don't know, sometime before 150 years ago, bettas were probably, you know, domesticated. But now thanks to mitochondrial DNA and new uh, computer modeling technologies, we can actually document and have data in the form of living fish and their DNA, uh, looking at the mitochondrial DNA, uh, that there is a story there and we can trace back the domestication and say for sure 1,200 years ago that it was occurring. So thankfully, this brand new mitochondrial DNA analysis and computer-generated gene mapping is rewriting our understanding of just how Many fish were being bred uh, into the pool uh, or the genetic bloodline and when and where this was occurring. So genomic analysis reveals that betta fish were domesticated more than 1,200 uh, years ago and that the genes changed all across this process with a bottleneck occurring around 150 to 200 years ago and most current day bettas coming from that period, the, the bottleneck period. But the first gene to be identified as being unique to human manip manip manipulation or domestication specifically is the gene DMRT1. And DMRT1 is the main sex determination gene in uh, ornamental bettas, but not in wild betta splendens. This discovery is evidence for a recent directional selection at the X allele locus uh, of a mutation occurring uh, that was not wild or not natural, meaning wild beta splendens are assigned to be male or female with a gene on the X and Y chromosome, just as people. However, uh, it was noticed in the 1970s that some beta were able to change their sex and produce uh, fertile and viable offspring. After years of studying this phenomena, it was discovered that that gene we just discovered a few years ago, DMRT1, that assigns 
uh, that is to either be male or female, was not in fact coupled to the X or Y chromosome like it's in humans, but rather that gene could be moved wherever. It could be found on the S or the T chromosome, the X or the Y, and still function in the same way. And this is a huge revelation uh, and something that is seen in amphibians and reptiles but had never been documented in fish. Furthermore, they found genes with signatures of recent strong selection that have large effects on color, fin size, body shape, and uh, all sorts of things like vitality and the ability to uh, f fight or struggle longer against opponents during spawning season. And they are oddly kind of all unlinked to those chromosomes. So they're all kind of a free-floating gene map. So research uh, results demonstrate how simple genetic architectures paired with anatomical uh, modularity can lead to a really vast phenotype of different betas and phenotypes the outward expression of those genes. And this occurred during the domestication. So the revelation is also that uh, the stage was set to use beta genomics the last few years as a system for developing physical traits being paired with the gene, obviously. And we can then go back and figure out what that is, which one's dominant and which one is not, or if it's codominant, or if it's a mutation altogether versus a trait that's on a sliding scale. All of these things are being sorted out right now, and massive research uh, efforts have been underway the last five or six years and were just published, allowing me to create this video. So back to the question of why were bettas kept by humans? Uh, well, in fields and ponds uh, where rice was grown, there's other present species, so why bettas? And I mean, the first thing is probably that the they control mosquitoes, they eat pest bugs and things like that. They don't bug the actual rice crop like some carp or catfish may. And uh, they don't, they're not harmful. They don't sting. Uh, they don't have any barbels or venom or anything like that. And secondly, as far as we can tell, I mean, they're just interesting. We also know from the time period that wrestling half beaks down in Indonesia and uh, down Sumatra and Java that they were being used for sport, which was to watch them uh, wrap around one another and fight and push and pull and see which one would tire out first and people would bet on it. Um, and these early matches uh, have been documented in wrestling half beaks, which is a wild strain of half beak. But now we're going to have to go back and look at that and see if maybe they were being selectively bred as well. So with that in mind, though, and the fact that, you know, as unfortunate as it is, animals were being fought and bet over all throughout Southeast Asia from dogs and chickens to, I mean, you really, you name it, and uh, they, they would bet on it, really, at some point in history. And during this period uh, in history, it wasn't really seen as, some, you know, terrible or mean thing to do. Uh, it was seen as kind of a harmless pastime. In fact, it was seen as a thing that a lot of kids did and uh, that a lot of peasant farmers would do after working all day is, you know, they'd watch, they'd fight. Um, there's also documentations of like tarantulas and scorpions and, you know, people just do uh, things to entertain themselves, even if that's at the expense of, you know, another creature. And bettas are beautiful after all. So the Veda is say, said to be named after an ancient warrior clan known as Unbeta. Uh, and unlike roosters or dogs being um, fought, Veda wrestling was a test of bravery and showing their flair and showing their fins more so than actually harming one another. The fish were uh, put into a bowl, at least early on, and early accounts even of Europeans, but also of uh, writings from the region uh, from as early as around the 14 and 1500s is when we first start hearing about uh, fish being uh, put in bowls so they could wrestle one another, uh, which 
ended up kind of being uh, more about which fish would give up and swim away or surrender more so than which fish would um, kill one another. And then the winner would be selected and bred in hopes that it would produce more males in the future that would be strong and a winner. Now, during this time, the blue, green, and red-bodied placot or short fin forms of beta splendens were the most popular. Um, because with the short fins, they're not going to snag a, a long fin and rip it and cause an infection or an inj injury that would stop them from being able to be fought. Uh, so before uh, about 150, 200 years ago, the fins were kept very tight to the body. And uh, as unfortunate as that is that people were fighting animals, uh, it's also not notable that dogs also would have skin that's loose that can't be, uh, you know, injured as easily and that they'd have ears and tails and things either clipped or kept close to the body uh, as strategies to keep them in the fight longer and not injured by superficial uh, injuries during a fight. So all of this seems to be true with the fish as well. They, they didn't have the big flary fins we think of today. So it's also due to an odd quirk of nature that bettas were being bred and that by breeding them aggressive, it ended up breeding them into more colorful fish in a lot of cases. So in the wild, betta have a limited access to food resources with carotenoids. And carotenoids are a chemical found in many plants, as well as like small crustaceans, insects, and things. And they allow fish to develop red pigmentation, uh, as well as anthocyanins in the environment too, which are a chemical that allow them to develop the yellows and oranges. Now, the more carotene uh, or the more lycopene, which are carotenoids, that these fish could get, uh, the more color they could take on. However, if they were not a red dominant beta, they also uh, would use uh, keratin first and foremost for their immune system. So it was used as an immune system booster naturally, like a vitamin that helped their immune system more than anything. And it was not until they were being selected for aggression that we noticed, oh wow, in red bettas, now in, in recent studies we've seen this, in red bettas, their body metabolizes those colors into being brighter and trying to stand out to a mate, whereas in the blue uh, base tone varieties or green base tone variety of bettas, they use it for not their color enhancement as much. I mean, it's still what is the cause of their color uh, highlights but they use it for their immune system. And so this led to a sort of famous study in the beta world of studies, which was another odd twist of genetic and evolutionary fate known as the carotene scarcity hypothesis. Or rather, the interesting trait that males can, uh, or, or large males who control a large area in their pond had access to more food with more of these compounds and chemicals in them in their evolutionary past. And the evolutionary purpose of these carotenoids is for immune system health. However, it has the byproduct of allowing color to build if they don't metabolize it for their immune system. So fish kind of have a choice of either being uh, the one that takes the carotenoids and becomes a big bright red and colorful male that catches the eye of the possible lady bettas, or they could be the one that lives an extra two seasons and is able to spawn more offspring that way by having a more robust immune system. So that's known as the keratin hypothesis, uh, shortage hypothesis, hypothesis um, or uh, the keratin uh, limiting hypothesis. It's had a couple names over the years. <clears throat> But an interesting thing to note that, you know, the, the quirk that just because the more aggressive ones became more and more red, uh, they probably saw that colors were really possible to be manipulated in bettas. And it is around this time that the genes, we first see that red dominant gene 
being bred into betas, uh, in beta splendens, but not just beta splendens. So again, uh, there is a distinct correlation between males with red genes being more aggressive, but it's not necessarily a causation of them being aggressive. So we don't know for sure about that. So this was clearly not lost on the beta breeders who were wrestling their fish and selectively breeding them uh, for that red base color. Now, typically, beta fought only once or twice uh, in, in um, higher standing uh, matches, like big time matches between villages. Uh, whereas when being kept by children and as a uh, hobby, they would have matches uh, a lot more often and uh, it wasn't worried so much about uh, them getting damaged or their fins getting damaged and uh, infections and things happening. In fact, there's actually uh, notes in the 14th century of them using uh, botanical teas and herbs to try to heal um, the uh, injuries from these matches so that they could uh, live to fight another day. So the winner was then selected, likely with the placot red body, short fins, and a longer slender body that could twist around its opponents and squeeze them into submission a bit better. Uh, and this is what we saw uh, as the dominant style of fish being bred, with slight variations happening as other species, apparently, according to genetics now, we know we're being bred in. So it seems uh, from oral traditions and just word of mouth uh, that the historical mentions and, and uh, details on these fish is a bit vague at the time, but uh, bettas were kept somewhere between 500 CE or AD and 1000 CE and AD. So this uh, may have been due to that recent husbandry link between China and the carp, koi, goldfish, uh, habitat and domestication going on, but it's not a far leap of logic to think that bettas may have been Southeast Asia's way of keeping a decorative fish of their own, for their own royalty, for their own entertainment and things, as well as just your common everyday people doing this. Uh, also, the, there's the added bonus that the fish also was being used uh, to make money, so obviously that's an incentive that people are going to want to uh, strive for. There's, there are ancient poems and songs related to fish wrestling, uh, especially in the Thai uh, highlands and hills uh, that note, uh, you know, that, that tout the, the traits and the abilities of a betta, like almost praise songs and poems for a winning fish. Uh, and there's also oral histories all the way down through Malaysia and over to Myanmar, back up to Laos and Vietnam, that by around 1,000 years ago or 1,000 CE, uh, that there were bettas at least being uh, kept and then selectively bred somewhat uh, for these matches in all of those locations all across Southeast Asia. However, today now what's in question is, was it one species that all branched from Thailand or were they using their own local bettas and happened to be uh, domesticating those? Or was it a muddled mix? And genetics is starting to show us that it may have been more of a muddled mix. You know, the betta's wild uh, range is over 1,500 miles east to west, if not 2,000, if you want to include Borneo, and uh, just about as many uh, north to south as well. So there are over 75 species now, and with probably quite a few more out there still, and we can look at their genetics and their haplogroups, which is their dad's kind of grouping, their, their overall giant groupings on a large scale over time, uh, and the genes that are associated with that, as well as now with that specific mitochondrial DNA, which is the DNA only found on the mother's side. So this signature uh, that would be nearly impossible to find in the wild is what we're looking for. Things uh, like... Um, you know, albino uh, traits being bred 
to another albino over and over and over, and with the gene that's now linked to large fins, we could guess that that's not a trait that would have survived in the wild. Um, now, all the traits that we can find that were being bred early on come from the beta splendens complex. So those are the same bettas that we keep today and call beta splendens, but they may actually be a mix of the entire complex of bettas. And due to those trait networks and cultural similarities, the reliance on rice and the seasonal, um, you know, the seasonal rain and how that affected culture and uh, their adaptation to uh, the region, people uh, shared a lot in common in these regions. And, you know, just as often as they were warring, they were trading and sharing ideas. And uh, morphologically, the region that we're looking at, we can see that there are species from all the way down in that far southern part of Borneo and around 800 years ago, so now we're moving 200 years more recent, around 800 years ago, the genetics seem to show that there are genes that today we can only find in wild bettas found in uh, Myanmar uh, or, or former Burma and down in all the way in Indonesia. And so it's very likely that people were bringing their line bred wild uh, beta species that were in the same grouping as beta splendens so they could hybridize with one another and that they were crossing them and getting different genes and traits for them. So uh, the group includes uh, six species uh, out of the 75 or so bettas that easily hybridize with one another. And we know those to be uh, the beta splendens, the beta uh, smarag Smaragdina, <laughs> the beta Maha Chiensis, the beta Styctos, the beta Embolus, and beta Siam Orientalis. And uh, in terms of appearance, the difference is really easy to see. All domestic species have bright and more artificial coloration. It's, it's exaggerated, while wild bettas such as beta Embolus or beta Maha Chiensis have a natural green iridescent color um, that the species uh, seem to show almost in front of a dark background so that you can see each of the scales. Also, uh, the fins on domestic type bettas, we see everything from veil tail, half moon, and those large fins today. But back in this period, this is when genes associated with some of the first rounded larger tails start showing up. And it's some time uh, that these traits are known to have uh, come into focus, sometime in that 600 to 800 years ago that these hybridizations between all six began to evolve. Now, also because of how hilly this region is and how rivers and islands and all sorts of other things cut people off, people may have tra traded for something, but then it may have been a long time before they got another fish or another uh, winner of a fish that they wanted to uh, breed into the lineages there. And so you may have uh, ended up with a dash of beta embolus for the large rounded tail uh, and the colors in the tail, a sprinkle of beta uh, smaragdina for the larger, longer fins uh, on the belly, and voila, you start to see something that looks like a pet, you know, ornamental betta. And this is what uh, royalty began taking an interest in keeping, as well as uh, common folks, you know, were drawn to it just as we are today. Uh, and so people working the rice paddies began to see these not only as a thing to bet on, but we start to actually see by 500, 600 years ago, art where it's pretty clear that it's bettas they're representing with these bigger fins and uh, um, colors being kept in ceramic bowls. And also we hear about it. Now, back to the genetics, uh, what are they telling us? So the last and most convincing piece of beta genomics that was just published at the end of 2022 as well is the presence of a magical domestication gene known as BAZ1B. 
Now, historically, we have a definition for domestication, meaning something that is very specific, that these are creatures that are peaceful and socially cooperative, and both uh, individuals get along when put together uh, within the species, and they tend to get along with humans uh, better than their feral counterparts, and they're able to be bred in captivity. Well, later in the 20th century, uh, anthropologists, biologists, and historians began to note that also guinea pigs, llamas, um, you know, other creatures were being uh, domesticated, not just cows and horses and goats and camels and uh, even elephants they include now. And they began to realize that it was those traits of being more peaceful, more sociable, but also that there was a distinct thing going on, especially with, you know, the cats and dogs is where they first noticed it, and that is with the ratio of their facial features. So no matter how different these creatures were, you know, from all over the spectrum of, of mammals, uh, they found that they have larger eyes, bigger dilated pupils more of the time, and that they had larger ears with smaller noses smaller teeth and shorter snouts and that the ratio between the distance from eye to eye down to the nose that triangle was actually the same as found in human babies when looking at them straight on which is really interesting um, because it as odd as it seems it means that domesticated animals end up being literally cuter to human sensibilities than their wild counterparts. And this is likely uh, due to the fact that they retain more, uh, you know, similar size and spacing ratios in the face to human babies. So just in case you weren't aware, uh, baby animals are met with affection in almost all cultures. And in something we called uh, pedomorphia, domesticated animals actually retain the traits of their, uh, you know, the, if it's a cat, they retain the traits of a kitten, and their face stays more kitten-looking than in a wild cat, uh, like a tiger or a lion or something. So in all human cultures, obviously, we all say, aww, and it's likely that this is an ev evolutionary response to humans being drawn and wanting to feel calm, happy, and protective of our own young and their faces that we think they're cute. So the story gets more bizarre in the 1990s and 2000s as genetics then confirm the commonalities between domesticated creatures, the things we say are domesticated. They actually have all also a underdeveloped neural crest, which is a little thing that forms in the embryo on their, their uh, spinal co column and head or brainstem, and uh, scientists are still trying to fully understand what this is, like why this is and what it means, but they also realize that the, the traits of being cooperative, peaceful, and uh, more affectionate, also being able to be, be bred in captivity, and lower aggression levels, um, that that is almost across the line what we see in domesticated animals that have the gene that now we have linked to domestication. Not only that, we have found that this gene is present in humans as well. And there's actually a hypothesis out that in, in human uh, archaeology and, uh, well, I, I suppose it's in a lot of different disciplines, but human uh, biology and uh, evolutionary biology the, the idea that we we domesticated ourselves by moving into cities, by living in dense groupings of humans, uh, over time we, we selected the most cooperative and peaceful ones of us, even though if you look at history, you may not think that right off the bat about humans uh, being so peaceful and cooperative if you think of all the wars, but uh, yeah, it's better than what we used to be apparently. So in physiology and morphology, the super interesting thing is that today, modern bettas, as well as zebrafish, guppies, koi, and goldfish, 
they all have the same weird ratio that babies do in their face, or at least closer to it, uh, even in a fish face, which is very different. And obviously a horse face versus a fish face versus a cat face, they're looking at it straight on, and I, I, uh, I don't have time to go into all of the details of the study, but it's a very, very persuasive case for the ancient keeping and husbandry of bettas in the fact that now we have this historical uh, document basis saying that they were being bred and that they were being selected for one thing. Uh, and then we also have the oral traditions that were discounted for most of history. And that is something that is ubiquitous in history. Europeans tend to ignore what the locals or indigenous groups are saying if they didn't write it down. We figure, how could they have it right? Well, the Thai people say that for over 200 generations, they've had the betta uh, as a pet or as a sport fish. And uh, it would appear that uh, the first mutations of that gene occurred then. Now, some people might be saying, wait, 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 wait. Domestication gene, DMRT1, uh, well, wait a minute. Like, if that's the domestication gene and... Uh, you know, so what? what is, you know, what's the deal? Why are some of them so aggressive uh, if they're supposed to be more cooperative and things like that? Well, it turns out that uh, the gene, uh, and I'm sorry, I misspoke. It's the BAZ1B gene, not the DMRT1. That was the sex-linked one. But the BAZ1B gene uh, that is associated with domestication, you know, it's there, but also if humans consistently select a dog, for instance, for um, battling other dogs, over time you can have mean traits develop, and that can override the nature of domestication, which is to be more docile. And so it's probably the fact that, you know, bettas were being bred with this idea of wrestling. and. Honestly, early on, it seems all indications are that wrestling is a pretty good way to talk about it, even though I'm saying I have to do that for YouTube. They were wrestling uh, one another, and one would tire out and then go hide at the bottom of the uh, ceramic bowl or uh, hide underneath uh, some lily or a bit of floating debris they'd have in the tank. Whereas the ones uh, early in a match are documented as, you know, being uh, aggressive to one another, coming into the other one's territory with kind of a halfway point in the middle of the pot and then people all around the pot wagering on it with even uh, specific rules and things becoming developed by the 1700s. So art from the 14th century, uh, so still we're talking over 500 years ago, uh, show a lot of fish that resemble betta. We're not sure if betta, snakehead, uh, gourami, uh, or what, but uh, reaching back to, you know, the 1390s or so, we see carvings and scrolls that have images of these fish in them as uh, decorative things. Now, what's mostly preserved from this period that's physical, hard evidence that, yes, they were being uh, domesticated, is betting tokens and uh, ledgers of money owed between people. Uh, so apparently, uh, these fish, as they were being domesticated, uh, they were also used to settle disputes between different villages and things, too. So they would resort to the idea of using a betta to kind of be the tiebreaker and since each village had their own uh, strains uh, in certain regions, they uh, kind of used this as a way to avoid war or conflict between family groups or, or tribal groups, uh, it, at least in the Thai region. Now, in Cambodia and uh, Burma, also in Angkor Wat and uh, the Khmer Empire, uh, this... We, we see uh, laws coming up that are saying, you know, if, if you're going to be uh, wrestling these fish, you better be paying the emperor, or only the emperor class can be uh, doing that with the domesticated ones. So there's some documentation of that, but uh, 
it hasn't been translated to English super well, and uh, it's still pretty vague and hard to find. I'm hoping that soon uh, we can work together with universities over there to kind of clarify that, because it could be common knowledge over there uh, in some community that, yeah, you know, this, this dynasty or this empire is when this trait happened or this, when this fish happened. Uh, so the transformation took place um, in Thai culture due to that rice cultivation and the hands-on aquaculture, agriculture link. Now, in the highlands where rainfall had to be supplemented by systems of irrigation canals and controlled by uh, the seasonal rains, they flooded the rice paddies and they, uh, the, the Thai started to grow this glutinous rice around 1,000 to 2,000 years ago. And that was the staple of Thailand for a long time. But in the floodplains of uh, the region known as Chael Freya or Pahraya, I, I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce it, it's P-H-R-A-Y-A, farmers turned to a different variety of rice around a thousand years ago, and it's called floating rice, and it's a slender, non-glutinous uh, grain that came from Bengal, India, and was introduced around a thousand years ago that would grow fast enough to keep pace with the rise in the water level in lowland fields. So it was less work agriculturally. And it also is a new way to keep rice that allowed for pens and containers to stay wet year round. And that's another little piece of evidence that uh, is kind of interesting that maybe this is the setting where bettas were uh, not just taken from the wild to be uh, wrestled, but they were starting to be selectively bred and kept in the same bodies of water or their babies were released into these ponds uh, because they were allowed to keep them year round. Uh, also local rulers and things from Laos to uh, Cambodia to uh, Thailand and Myanmar, they would also tax the use of water on those step terraces, and they would uh, limit the, the diversion of water in irrigation. So before that time, water was pretty sacred and expensive, so to speak. A lot of labor went into uh, the irrigation canals and things too. And uh, so it, it's interesting to note that there was more time in the day uh, to actually you know, go out and have free time right around a thousand years ago in the lowland uh, riverine regions and coastal regions of Thailand and Vietnam uh, because of the changes in their uh, rice growing. Now, uh, they would get the, the bettas from the rice paddies and they would select them. It's documented for their temperament and vitality and how long they would wrestle for. Um, but like I said before, this was not the vicious type of fighting that later did happen in uh, the history of this fish. And as inhumane as it is, this was to put two fish together in a bowl, encourage them to wrestle, one gets tired out, the other one retreats or kind of uh, disassociates and stops fighting back. Then they declare a winner, and uh, they're really more excited about the lip locking, the flaring of the gills, the showing off of these larger traits by 1600, 1700. And so they want to see bigger fins and more color uh, to show the sport uh, being a little different. And in the royal families and things, they didn't want to ever fight these fish to the end in that they didn't want to damage those fins and things, uh, like I said. So the aggression was being selected for and also that's where we start to see all those other uh, six types of bettas being blended together and also there there being um, there there's a culture of material artifacts we can see with these ceramic bowls from 16 1700s uh, with pictures of bettas uh, wrestling on the outside so the primary goal is exhaustion and also kind of uh, like bravado or, or courage in the fish. And they actually didn't want 
the ones that were biting fins or ripping scales, so to speak. And it was later that it appears that actually that style of more aggressive fish wrestling happened where they would even encourage fish to the end, unfortunately. And uh, the, the guess, if, if you look at all the historical context, is that uh, at this time, you know, we, we can see documents of people talking about loaning out fish to breed, breeding fish from other regions, other cities, and sailors from Europe, from Asia, from Japan, from India, from the, uh, from the Arab Peninsula, they're all coming into this region for spices and for, you know, silk and exotic goods and things, for fruits and for hardwoods and stuff. And they are kind of crossing their cultures. And uh, this is kind of the start of of a real fast paced global commerce in real time. You know, before this, it was hand to hand to hand to hand down the Silk Road or uh, leapfrogging uh, its way uh, over, you know, maybe a hundred years, some trade good may make it out of China down into Borneo uh, and become a trinket for the most wealthy or something like that. However, now there was a direct setup with, you know, the region that the people came from being represented right there in the city. And when this happened, also urbanization really kicked up a notch. And in the port cities like Bangkok, there's a large influx of young men from merchant ships from far-flung locations looking to uh, drink, gamble, fight, uh, all sorts of vice, you know. And it's this setting in the late 1700s, early 1800s, that it seems like uh, perhaps it was Westerners, perhaps it was just the mood in general, but that then the genes, we see another shift and we see a bottleneck. And while the royal family and in um, parts of Thailand, we see the big fins and the color genes um, continuing to be worked on, uh, it's kind of remote, whereas the vast majority uh, along the coast from uh, central Thailand and down all the way down to Singapore and into Jakarta, Malaysia, all through the, the kind of, if you follow the coastlines of where the cities are um, in the, that area, um, in, the, in the South Asian Sea down there and in the Andaman Sea on the other side, we start to see that the bettas that were most popular were, again, more wild uh, infused ones, uh, so probably more aggressive, and also them being crossed with the red, short-finned, longer-bodied, aggressive uh, males from the domesticated groupings, too. And this is uh, also where we start to see stories of intoxicated sailors that become ubiquitous around ports of the world. And in Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia, uh, you know, places like Rangoon, uh, we start to see uh, European trading port cities and the exotic traditions of, you know, fish wrestling and things like this start to become all the craze uh, when the rich in Europe and America and in the Americas start to hear about it. Now, with all these fin colors and color morphs within the Thai royal family, uh, they introduce a tax under King Rama III of Thailand, uh, specifically, and sports betting and breeding of that kind of betta is then taxed. Also, at the same time, Buddhist missionaries uh, and monasteries start to say, like, don't do this, it encourages drunkenness and human fighting and things like this. Uh, and we start to see the mix of genes from bettas as far away as actually Borneo start to enter the, the mix um, in this period. And this is where Europeans start keeping them in colonial Southeast Asia. Uh, however, you know, by the 1800s, these matches actually started to get really organized and become social events in a lot of those port cities. And visitors, you know, knew that in Siamese territory or in Siam, you could go purchase a betta on a vendor row and then you could take it and bet on it uh, or, you know, have it as a keepsake while you were there. 
And uh, it seems, from what we can tell, some of the, the pretty large fin and colorful fin genes that are around today, uh, the vast majority of those happen in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, but some did exist from this earlier period, and that's probably from the royal family. And these genes were probably kept away from those kind of uh, more seedy places that were just interested in fighting these fish. Um, so that kind of brings us up into the modern era. And in the next installment, we'll be talking about how globalized trade New technologies uh, and new improvements in shipping, you know, steam ships and ocean liners, and the advent of the system of colonialism based out of Europe changes the cultural landscape forever of Southeast Asia and the world. And some of these fish, uh, by the late 1800s, uh, start making it back to Europe. 1910, they start to make it to America. And we're going to talk all about that era and when most of the traits you'd recognize today, like half moon and veil tail and things like that, were for sure, you know, we have the written evidence, photographic or drawn evidence, and we also can see the genes. In these periods before, we can see maybe the gene was present, but we don't know 100% that, that that meant the mutation of a veil tail, for instance. But we do know that that's where the mutation occurred when it did occur and so it was kept so i hope you guys enjoyed this uh i hope that it was you guys found it just as fascinating as i do and did and uh i hope you guys will stay tuned for when i come out with the next episode that brings us all the way up to the modern day and the better we know and love uh although by this period uh this is when all the scientific names were starting to be given uh, this period that we just talked about uh, in the late and mid 1800s uh, and that is when modern science you know is said to have sort of begun all right guys i hope you guys enjoyed it i will see you next time on the secret history living in your aquarium and i hope you have a wonderful day talk to you guys later